It's a particular pleasure for me to be here today, not only representing uh, my colleagues uh, and my team at, at Federal Highway Administration and USDOT, but uh, representing our nation's transportation secretary, uh, Anthony Fox. I want to use uh, my time to give you a progress report on some of the issues uh, we discussed at the annual meeting uh, in Chicago and update you on some others. When we met back in September, uh, I was newly confirmed as administrator and spoke with you about my priorities and those of Secretary Fox, including his commitment in make, uh, to making sure transportation provides ladders of opportunity for the American people. Um, so as our partners, uh, so as our partners in these endeavors, I believe you're due a status check on where things stand and a sense of the work still ahead. I'd like to start with something of uh, great uh, personal and professional importance to Secretary Fox. Uh, other than safety, the relationship between transportation and opportunity is his top priority. This is a very personal issue for the Secretary, <coughs> reflecting his experience growing up in a part of Charlotte, North Carolina that was cut off from the rest of the city by a couple of interstate highways. This not only posed physical barriers, but according to the Secretary, had a psychological impact as well, relegating the neighborhood to second-class status. This was not only happening in Charlotte, but in cities all across the country, cutting off communities, often poor minority communities, from opportunity. We can't undo what was done. But as you know, as well as I, our nation is at a point where our aging infrastructure needs extensive replacement and rebuilding, much of which is long overdue. That presents us with an opportunity. In preparing our transportation system for the future, we have a chance to create a system that works for all people and all communities, linking them to opportunity while preserving and safeguarding their neighborhoods. The Secretary has provided a clear and compelling roadmap for making that happen. He's laid out three core principles of what he calls inclusive design. On behalf of Secretary Fox, I'd like to share those principles with you. First, transportation connects people to opportunity and can invigorate opportunity within communities. To the greatest extent, extent possible, we should tra support transportation projects that do both. Second, while we can't change the past, we can ensure that current and future transportation projects connect and strengthen communities, including areas that have in the past been on the wrong side of transportation decisions. And third, transportation facilities should be built by, for, and with the communities impacted by them. Development of transportation facilities should meaningful, meaningfully reflect and incorporate the input of all people in the communities that they touch. We all understand and live it every day. We all understand that transportation decisions we make together today will have an impact, positive or negative, for generations to come. <coughs> the Secretary urges us to make decisions that lead to investments in which all communities will benefit by connecting them to opportunity. And so I join Secretary Fox in urging you and everyone in the transportation community your support for the core principles of an inclusive transportation system, because I know state DOTs across the country with their local partners, MPOs, local transportation agencies, and private sector stakeholders reflect this every day in the work that you do. So I want to turn now to updating you on the progress we've made and some of the priorities that make up our agenda. When we met in September, I told you I had ambitious plans to make the maximum use of my time in office serving Secretary Fox in the Obama administration. I pledged to make our partnership the centerpiece of an ongoing effort to serve safety, mobility, and economic needs of the traveling public. To meet those goals, I laid out four major priorities <coughs> that I not only shared with you, but that I presented to Congress in the course of my confirmation process. So let me start by briefly visiting those priorities. We all shared the goal of working with Congress to achieve a long-term funding bill and notwithstanding the fact that it wasn't Paul Trombino's selected priority, congratulations nonetheless. Because um, Paul was quoted at the time as saying, quote, it was a tremendous relief to see Congress pass and President Obama sign the FAST Act. I could not agree more. And congratulations uh, not only to Paul but all of ASHTO for the work that you did 
uh, in your states with your congressional members in helping to continuously underscore the critical nature of having a long-term uh, funding bill. Uh, nor could I be prouder of the tremendous effort that Secretary Fox put forth to raise the issue of transportation investment with Congress and the American people. Through dozens of congressional he uh, meetings, two bus tours, and 40, uh, visits to 43 states over two years, the Secretary made the case that investing in America's infrastructure was an investment in America's economic future and the well-being of its people. The word you hear most often in connection with the FAST Act is certainty, a critical element in the ability of our partnership to fund, plan, develop, and deliver projects. From our standpoint, we see the FAST Act as a down payment on the important work that lies ahead. The Secretary's Beyond Traffic report has injected a sense of urgency to that work with its projection that the United States will be home to 70 million more people and need to move 45% more freight by 2045. 70 million more people, that's twice the population of Canada. I know you're very familiar with the FAST Act itself, but I do want to update you on our work implementing it. Bud and a few others from AASHTO joined us uh, at DOT a couple of weeks ago uh, to discuss implementation, and I won't speak for Bud, from certainly from our standpoint, uh, in term, including the Secretary's office, it was a very constructive and productive meeting. And we, uh, uh, we've explained that we're moving quickly to distribute as much funding as possible to maximize the impact of the new law. About 92% of the FY 2016 FAST Act funding was apportioned by early January. We've also issued notices for a number of other funding opportunities, including UTC grants, fast lane grants, and TIFIA loans. And we've issued more than 50 guidance documents and nearly 400 Q&As uh, and other materials to make sure uh, all stakeholders have the information that they need so we can hit the ground running. The dialogue between Federal Highway and AASHTO, uh, certainly, I can assure you, will continue throughout the implementation process. The second priority I mentioned back in September is really uh, our top priority as an industry, and that's to continue our work to improve safety on our roads. Several months ago, we issued uh, the two final rules related to safety, the Highway Safety Improvement Program Rule and the Performance Measures Rule for that program. Both of those rulemakings were initiated under MAP 21, and we included changes uh, by, the, uh, by the FAST Act, made by the FAST Act. We also, which means we don't have to go back and update them again. We also continue to work with our state and industry partners to implement the next generation of roadside safety hardware as aggressively as we can. We've launched a two-year pilot study to evaluate the in-service performance of the common end terminals currently in use around the country. We'll be collecting data, uh, data in uh, Missouri, Pennsylvania, California and Massachusetts, and we hope to issue a final report by the end of 2017. My gratitude to uh, those states for their uh, support and cooperation. We're also expecting a report from the General Accounting Office on our oversight of roadside safety hardware and related state policies and practices. And we've engaged USDOT's uh, Volpe Center to conduct an independent review of the entire process for developing and evaluating roadside safety hardware. And as you know, AASHTO has established a schedule to transition to the MASH standard on the testing and design of roadside safety hardware. So a lot of work being done and I think a lot of progress being made. Third, I pledge to you and to Congress to continue the progress being made through our Everyday Counts Innovation Partnership with the states. Innovation in all its forms has no greater champion than Anthony Fox. From the beginning of his tenure, He's embraced our Everyday Counts partnership and been one of its greatest advocates. My pride in this partnership is sincere. So is my gratitude to each of you and your predecessors for what we've accomplished and for accomplishments yet to come. Congress, the American people, and our fiscal realities demand that we become more efficient in project delivery and more aggressive in deploying time-saving, money-saving, and life-saving technologies. That's exactly what this partnership between Federal Highway and the state DOTs has done. We're now midway through our third round of EDC. And as the uh, AASHTO Innovation Initiative uh, heard yesterday from Tom Harmon, 
we'll be rolling out our uh, round four innovations later in the summer. We've showcased 32 innovations during the first three rounds, with each state deploying 10 or more. From the very beginning, Every Day Counts was envisioned as a state-driven, stakeholder-engaged partnership. Today it's thriving thanks to several factors. The engagement and leadership by state CEOs, AASHTO, Federal Highway, and USDOT. Without this leadership, Every Day Counts would not have been possible. And I always have to say, without the leadership of former Administrator and now Deputy Secretary, Victor Mendez, it certainly would never have gotten off the ground, and we all recognize that. The engagement and support of our partners in the private sector. We all know who delivers projects. It's us in partnership with them. A formal process to establish, evaluate, and select innovations. Clear goals and performance metrics. And lastly, and most importantly, the engagement and involvement of what I call the people <coughs> on the front lines of project delivery in state DOTs across the country, the people who make those day-to-day -day project level decisions. They are the ones who really lead in innovation, but they can't do it without the support of their top leadership, and I think that's the combination uh, that really made it successful. So as you know, I always like to offer a few examples uh, of success stories to support uh, the Everyday Count story, and here are a few. It typically took 72 months to complete the environmental impact assessment required for major projects. Now, thanks to a number of EDC innovations, that process has been streamlined to an average of 42 months with 40% savings in time and resources. That 72% number was in 2010. So substantial progress made since then, and that's the progress that reflects the hard work at state DOTs, uh, local transportation agencies, and MPOs across the country. The number of states using new intersection and interchange geometrics more than doubled under EDC to 38. I often cite the work of Charlie Zelli's Minnesota DOT to build restriction, a restricted crossing U-turns at 10 locations with a history of severe right ankle crashes. This was done at one-tenth the cost, converting these at-grade intersections to interchanges. And there have been no severe crashes at the new R-cut uh, locations. I also like to highlight the acceptance of high friction surface treatments by 37 states, Washington, D.C., and Puerto Rico, up from 14 states at the beginning of the deployment effort under EDC Round 2. One of my favorite examples is the Marquette Interchange in Milwaukee, which saw 219 crashes in the three years before HFST was applied, but only nine crashes in the three years after. Uh, well done. That was, uh, those are extraordinary numbers in my judgment. Scott Bennett in Arkansas used stick incentive funds to customize software, upgrade systems, and hire experts to train his team in 3D modeling. This is improving the project design process and bringing greater efficiency to project delivery. And in Michigan, Kirk Steidel and his team are using e-construction to create a paperless construction environment. E-construction comes from the partnership between Federal Highway and the Ashto Innovation Initiative. In 2014, AII selected e-construction as a focus technology, and it was then selected to be part of uh, Round 3 in Everyday Counts. States report saving as much as $40,000 per project per year using this technology. And of course, there is also the time savings. A research project involving the Washington, Minnesota, and Texas DOTs estimates e-construction saves almost two hours per day per inspector and allows the inspector to collect two to three times more information about the project. That's efficiency. These are all great examples of how EDC innovations are saving time, saving money, and often, more, more, most importantly, saving lives. To me, the ultimate endorsement of what we have done together is Congress choosing to recognize the work we've done together by codifying Everyday Counts by Name in the FAST Act, uh, essentially making it law of the land, but effectively being just a high-level endorsement that they know what we're doing, they like what we're doing, they're urging us to keep moving forward. It's a rock remarkable acknowledgement of our success and the commitment you and your predecessors have made to innovation. I want to pick up on the e-construction example and its origin in the AASHTO Innovation Initiative. It helps me transition into an exciting announcement, strengthening Federal Highway's commitment to AASHTO as a major partner in advancing 
innovation and transportation. Yesterday, Bud and I signed a memorandum of understanding formalizing the relationship between AASHTO Innovation Initiative and our Federal Highway Center for Accelerating Innovation. The AII is under the leadership of my good friend Rich Tetro from the great state of Vermont, and I want to thank him, Kirk, <coughs> Paul, and Bud, and everyone else for their great work in making this joint venture possible. The MOU formalizes our already strong partnership on Everyday Counts and provides funding support from Federal Highway to foster new, new innovations for the EDC pipeline. I'm also committing to support the support of my team at Federal Highway to make this joint venture a complete success. In signing the agreement, AASHTO and Federal Highway are, signif are signifying our sustained commitment to innovation and to the role our partnership plays in fostering the EDC pipeline and supporting deployment of innovation, uh, innovative solutions. I'm also pleased that our Center for Accelerating Innovation is partnering with AII on a new peer awards program to recognize excellence in the state transportation innovation councils. The award will be one of the many ways we grow the culture of innovation by recognizing excellence and performance. Our, per our partnership also extends to environmental health of our highway roadsides. I am particularly grateful to Charlie Zelli, Commissioner uh, for Minnesota, who took the lead in pr on preparing a draft memorandum of understanding that memorializes a multi-state agreement for the support of a monarch highway route. I also want to acknowledge Bruce uh, Rodan from the White House Office of uh, Science and Technology Policy. The White House has been a leader in protecting pollinator habitat and we're all extremely pleased uh, to join that effort and uh, Bruce will participate in the signing of those agreements uh, shortly. This MOU will establish a cooperative and coordinated effort to promote best practices and public awareness of the monarch butterfly and other pollinator conservation efforts. Uh, the I-35 states uh, participating in this pilot, uh, Minnesota, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and Texas, and we just want to express our gratitude for your partnership and cooperation. We're going to do great work that will provide uh, real leadership and, uh, and data and experience the rest of the nation can benefit from. How, how often do we get a chance in the highway uh, and bridge sector especially to participate in something that is going to uh, support the ongoing effort to provide adequate food supplies not only for the United States but for the world. So it's a great opportunity for us to be involved in something that uh, has a profound impact uh, on our friends and neighbors. So that sets the table for my final priority I want to update you on. That's the building, uh, building on our innovation network, um, or more correctly, completing that network. On Monday, April 18th, Ford Fuchigami, director of the Hawaii Department of Transportation, and Maela uh, Sosa, our Federal Highway Division Administrator in Hawaii, signed their State Transportation Innovation, Co Innovation Council <coughs> charter completing the national stick network. This is something I've thought about, talked about, and even dreamed about uh, since we launched EDC in 2009 because the power of organization and collaboration is really what uh, the advancement of innovation requires. And I think we have done so in a way that provides a real example to uh, other government agencies, certainly a unique, I think, uh, a unique approach in the federal government. But thanks to our work together, we now have a complete network with a stick in every state, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and our Federal Lands Highway Program. The completion of the National Stick Network is a significant milestone, and I thank you for your leadership and commitment to the collaborative culture represented by the sticks. But as we celebrate this long-awaited day, let's put things in perspective. It isn't the finish line. It's the starting line. We need to engage the national network more than ever, learning from each other's successes. I look forward to continuing to nurture and develop this network because I think it has a still untapped potential to identify and deploy innovation that could be advanced through everyday counts. I look forward to continuing to work with you uh, in those efforts. I want to transition here to talk about some organizational changes we've made at Federal Highway. But rather than just being inside baseball, these changes will have a direct bearing on the innovation work I've just described, offering, offering that network a new level of support. The changes are within our Office of Innovative Program Delivery and our Office of Technical Services. 
First, the changes in OIPD. The office will be comprised of four new centers. These centers will provide greater focus and visibility to our efforts to advance innovation in several aspects of our transportation business. The changes build off our EDC efforts and the model, complement the establishment of a national surface transportation environment uh, and an innovative finance bureau, which will from here on in be known as simply the bureau. And ladders of opportunity. They'll further develop and utilize networks we currently use, like state transportation innovation councils, the LTAP TTAP network, and re, uh, regional workforce development centers. The part of the reorganization that's most relevant to the innovation network is the decision to bring the Center for Accelerating Innovation into OIPD. The Center will continue its current mission of facilitating the rapid deployment of innovation through our Everyday Counts partnership and will continue to support the newly completed National Stick Network. I've talked in the past uh, about our taking that network to the next level uh, and helping it cement a permanent and central role in the future of our industry. I believe that putting the center in OIPD under the leadership of Tony First and Tom Harmon will provide the support the network needs to reach the next level. The other centers that will now fall under OIPD are the Center for Innovative Finance Support, this center will support the Bureau by providing resources and technical assistance in the areas of tolling, Garvey bonds, and state infrastructure banks. It will serve as Federal Highway's connection to the Bureau and work with it to identify and coordinate Federal Highway technical assistance for transportation projects receiving Bureau support. Next, the Center for Transportation Workforce Development. We've established this new center to provide national leadership coordination and direction for the workforce elements of existing programs at Federal Highway, like regional workforce centers and the university and grants program. It will support the on-the-job training component and the federal aid program by advancing innovative practices and workforce development. And we will work to leverage established Department of Labor networks and Federal Highways Regional Workforce Centers to develop opportunities for transportation workforce development outside of Federal Highway. I will also look forward to working closely with you and our partners at AGC, ARCPA, on the new joint initiative to attract, develop, and train transpo the transportation workforce of the future. And we're already discussing, Bud and I have been, had some recent conversations with our partners about engaging uh, other groups as well. Here are the, the Center for Local Aid Support. This newly established center will provide national leadership and direction to the LTAP and TTAP networks to advance innovative practices in those communities. I also want to mention the changes in our Office of Technical Services. This is not an organizational change as much as a renewed focus. Federal Highway will be investing more resources to modernize our knowledge management policies and practices to continue to improve Federal Highways uh, and our partners' professional, professional and technical capacity. So this effort is going to be led by uh, our Chief Technical Services Officer, Amy Lucero. As you know, I started holding a series of uh, freight economy roundtables around the country beginning in February. We've held 15 so far, including one here on Monday in Des Moines with my friend Paul Trombino and Bud Wright attending. Many thanks to everyone who's joined us and taken part of these <coughs> roundtables in your states. We still have about nine more to go. One of the goals of the roundtables is to highlight the tremendous growth in freight, a tsunami as I described it, that Beyond Traffic says is coming our way. But they are also intended as a place for discussion and sharing ideas. Paul Trombino has played a big role in inspiring that. He's written and spoken very persuasively about the role our transportation system plays in helping our businesses compete, succeed, and create jobs, what I call the freight economy. In some of the communities we visited, 30 to 40 percent of the jobs have some, have some connection, direct or indirect, to freight. Paul has also challenged us to work more closely with the business community to better understand their transportation needs and the challenges they face. That's been the foundation of the roundtables as we bring together government leaders, manufacturers, and shippers <coughs> in each community to discuss these issues. We've heard quite a few interesting stories highlighting successes and opportunities we haven't seized yet. 
The Miami Roundtable yielded such an example. The Port of Miami Tunnel, which opened in August 2014, is clearly a success story in this regard. This project gives trucks a direct connection to and from the port to the interstate and made the surrounding area safer and less congested by taking thousands of, stru uh, of trucks off the downtown city streets of Miami every day. This addresses a concern we heard in a number of roundtables, which is the impact on, of trucks on local streets and local communities. The port is the second largest generator of economic activity in South Florida, supporting 176,000 jobs, 6.4 billion in wages, and 17 billion in economic activity. The only way for that port to grow is for that investment to be made. That is an absolute fact. On the other hand, a story we heard about Mike si uh, Mount Sinai Hospital on Miami Beach represents an opportunity we could seize with more investment. There's so much traffic, freight and otherwise, on the roads surrounding this major medical center, 5,000 people in that community, that many of the doctors and other staff find it difficult to get to work, not to mention the patients and their families and the delays that they experience, which sometimes can be serious. The situation has gotten so bad that some of the doctors and staff are said to be looking for jobs at other hospitals, which would have obviously a profound impact on the hospital and the surrounding community. We also talk, uh, uh, we also talk at the roundtables about specific projects that would greatly improve freight, imp uh, freight movement but don't have the funds to move forward. How many stories like that do you have in your states? When we held our first roundtable in Atlanta, we talked about the proposal to add designated truck lanes to a congested part of I-75, a project that would result in safer, less congested travel for all users. The project is in the governor's 10-year transportation plan, but all the funds haven't been identified. Another common tale. I also used the roundtables as a chance to raise the issue of truck parking and the coalition we formed with you and other stakeholders to address this critical issue. So these have been very informative and educational sessions, and we intend to synthesize what we learned in these roundtables in order to share it with the entire transportation community and create and sustain an ongoing dialogue about the need to maintain what Congress has now established as really our first funded direct program for freight <coughs> investment, and the Secretary will soon be uh, releasing and delivering to Congress uh, the uh, National Freight Strategic Plan, which is also going to provide uh, a roadmap uh, to help us identify critical regional and national priorities essential to enable our economy to grow in the future. So that's my overview um, of what we set out to do and where we stand toward achieving it. Uh, I hope when we meet in the fall, we'll be able to reflect on promises made and promises kept. The one overriding priority I have one that really supports all the others, is to maintain the strong, respectful, working relationship we all have with each other. That relationship is critical to accomplishing our other goals, including the smooth implementation of the FAST Act, the improvement of safety on our roads, and the deployment of innovation through our newly completed stick network. And it's at the center of our efforts to achieving the Secretary's goal of connecting communities and people to opportunity. I'm excited for the months ahead and optimistic about the success stories that we're going to continue to write together. Thank you very much for having me, and please enjoy the rest of uh, the spring meeting in this wonderful city and wonderful state. Reminds me a lot of my home. Thanks.